Welcome back. I'm Joy Reid sitting in for Melissa Harris Perry. This week, we got to see the president do something he rarely does, something with real implications on race and social policy, something he's been criticized by some in the progressive community for not doing often enough. In fact, until this week, he had only done it once before in the five years of his presidency. On Thursday, President Obama commuted the sentences of eight federal inmates, all of whom were in prison thanks to mandatory drug sentencing laws. Which made, which made crack cocaine offenses a hundred times more punishable than powder cocaine offenses. The president narrowed that gap by signing the Fair Sentencing Act in 2010, but as he noted on Thursday, the law only affects some new, only affects new cases. So that for thousands of inmates, it came too late. Because of a disparity in the law that is now recognized as unjust, they remain in prison. And perhaps no case is more indicative of just how unjust that law was than the case of one of those eight inmates, who will now get to leave prison early. Now, regular viewers of this show will recognize his name. It's Clarence Aaron. Aaron, a one-time student athlete at Southern University, was convicted and sentenced in 1993 at age 24 for his nonviolent role in a drug deal involving nine kilograms of cocaine and one kilogram of crack. It was his first offense, and he was neither the dealer, the supplier, nor the buyer of the drugs. But he received three life sentences without parole from the judge. When he said that, I was sitting in my chair and I was thinking to myself, I said, what in the world do I supposed to start doing three life sentences at? Why I supposed to start at in the middle? And you ain't part of where? I just couldn't believe that this was occurring to me. Aaron first applied for commutation two years after that frontline interview. It was a good case, but it grew even better in 2008, when both the new U.S. attorney for Southern Alabama and the, even the judge who sentenced Aaron started to advocate for commutation. The person who could make that happen, however, was this guy, the U.S. pardon attorney, Ronald Rogers. But according to a ProPublica report last year, Aaron's case was mishandled by Rogers, who failed to accurately convey the views of the U.S. attorney and the judge. The ProPublica report prompted outrage and drew national attention, including on this program, to Aaron's case. It also earned the attention of President Obama, who in July of 2012 called for Aaron's case to be reviewed again. Then this Thursday, just over a week after the 20th anniversary of Aaron's conviction, the White House announced that he was one of eight nonviolent drug offenders, seven black and one Latino, whose sentences would be commuted. Aaron can go home in April. In his official statement, the president said, quote, commuting the sentences of these eight Americans is an important step toward restoring uh, fundamental ideals of justice and fairness, but it must not be the last. That's notable given that President Obama has the lowest clemency record in recent history. This week's decision to commute the sentences of eight inmates brings the total number of commutations to nine. Arguably, this move won't win the president any political capital. It won't boost his sagging approval ratings or help the Democrats in the midterms. In other words, there's really no political margin in it for this president. But this is one of those cases where we get to see the progressive President Barack Obama shining through. And joining me this morning, Daphna Linzer, managing editor for MSNBC.com and the former senior reporter at ProPublica, who broke this story about Clarence Aaron's botched commutation case in 2012. And also with her are Anthea Butler, professor of religious studies at the University of Pennsylvania, Ovik Roy, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and Lisa Cook, economics professor at Michigan State University. And so, Daphna, uh, I have to go to you first. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, you really did break the story and have been all over the story. Walk us through how Clarence Aaron's case actually came up again and how this actually happened for him to get his freedom again. Sure. Well, I just love the way that you introduced him because he was, in fact, a wonderful case regardless. Um, his sentence was so shocking to so many people when it happened. And, and this was at the, the height of the drug war uh, when prosecutors were very eager to make examples of young black men across the country, especially in places like Mobile, Alabama, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, he was caught up in a conspiracy. And yet, as you said, not the buyer, the user, the seller, the he dealer, the supplier. People. To each other. That's right. He had two friends who were both involved in the conspiracy. He refused to snitch. At that time, snitching was a, a device that prosecutors were using to get people to turn against one another. Everyone in the conspiracy turned against him. Uh, he got three life sentences, which, as I said, just was appalling. People saw immediately this is a good case for a commutation. Uh, this was early on. Uh, he applied. Uh, he waited. 
White House didn't make any decision. The case went back and forth. Then, as you said, a big turn in the case for him. Uh, in 2008, uh, the federal judge who sentenced him, who was a Reagan appointee, who had seen years and years of the drug war failing in his court, uh, changed his mind and said, this guy needs to get out now. It's been 15 years. It's enough. And can you explain Ron Ronald Rogers' role in this? He is the, the U.S. pardon attorney. What was his role in stopping that from happening. Right. His role was to actually try to prevent all of this from occurring, and he was incredibly successful. Um, regardless of the sentencing judge, uh, regardless of the support of the uh, U.S. prosecutor, the U.S. attorney, uh, who was a Bush appointee, uh, Ron Rogers made a decision to withhold that information from the White House to write that there was not the support from the judge or from the uh, U.S. attorney for an immediate commutation and recommended that Aaron stay in prison for longer. He needed longer to be in a maximum security or a medium security facility. Um, he needed to grow older behind bars. But are there any consequences for that? I mean, it's extraordinary to me when you're telling me the essentially, I mean, withholding information by a prosecutor in a normal criminal case, there are potential consequences for that. Are there any for Mr. Rogers? Absolutely. And when I did this story, uh, the inspector general's office went and did an investigation of the story, confirmed all of the findings, and wrote a scathing report last year that said Ron Rogers had failed to uh, failed in his duties to inform the president of the United States. That's a devastating thing to say to somebody who is a government employee. Absolutely. Uh, the White House ordered a new review of the case of Clarence Aaron. He recused himself from the case, Ron Rogers, and was not fired and remains there today. And although President Obama has uh, commuted the sentences of eight people this week, Ron Rogers has said no to 5,000 others during this president. I, I find this really extraordinary, Anthea, because yeah. obviously there is the, ele you know, the elephant in this particular room mm -hmm. is race. Seven oh. of the eight people commuted were African-American, one Latino. These are crack, crack cocaine sentences, which are extraordinarily long compared to powder cocaine, which is also a racial issue. I mean, talk about what this means about the president diving back into this thorny issue of race and disparity. Well, I think it means two things. One, I think it means that he is very concerned about this. And I think between him and the Justice Department, I think that hopefully by the time we see the end of the second term, he will commute even more sentences because I think this is one place where he can make, you know, make a sea change. And you can't, you can't ignore this with books like Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, all of the problems of people. We have massive incarceration issues of people who shouldn't even be in prison in the first place because they had one rock, you know, and it didn't make any sense. I think the second thing, though, is really important when we talk about rock Rogers, is that this is a chain of command. And if this is supposed to be the one thing that the president does have as his total power, and we have this little underling person who has decided that he wants to be judge and jury, and that he can lie to the president of the United States and have no consequences for it, that is troubling to me. So that means already that we have somebody in the pipeline who's preventing the president from making the kinds of choices he wants to make because he has deemed that these people should not be in the pool to get pardoned in the first place. So yeah. you have to, I mean, is there any movement around having consequences? Having Rogers held to account because it seems to me that if you're saying he's holding 5,000 additional people's cases uh, mm -hmm. from you know coming up for a pardon, it, it does seem incredible that there's no outside pressure being brought to bear against him. Agreed. The inspector general had recommended um, that the attorney general's office take take some sort of action, so some kind of action to reprimand him to review his case. Um, the Justice Department has not told me what that is, so I don't know where that stands. Um, but he is, he is still there. Um, and, I, and I do think that there is, you know, a lot of problems in that office. You know, the reason I got to Clarence Aaron's case in the first place was because I embarked on the sort of an attempt to look at race and the effects of race in awarding presidential pardons across the board. Um, presidents really only get their information from this pardon office. They don't know the race of any candidate they pardon, but the pardons office does. Um, it turns out that the pardons office, and because based on their recommendations, presidents are pardoning whites by a factor of four. If you are uh, a white candidate, your chances of getting a pardon are four times as likely than all minorities combined. And that is because of the information. The, par the, the pardons office is the one who actually 
knows that and That's knows correct. those statistics and the president does not. That's correct. It would be great to see the president actually can't champion mandatory minimum sentencing reform because I bet he could get a lot of Republican support for that. There's been a lot of thawing on the Republican and conservative side around these inflexible sentencing laws, sentencing, sentencing laws that prevent, that, that create the cases. Right. Like There's only bipartisan case. support for this. And I think you see the, uh, you know, just the results of these small moves this week. Um, there's no backlash. There's no political price that the president has paid for any of this. I think that this is something that actually makes presidents feel good. It's yeah. a good and it would thing and it would do. help the economy. Sixty yeah. percent of those incarcerated are in for nonviolent offenses. This is costing California forty-five thousand dollars a year. It's costing them eight thousand dollars to support a college per student person. Per, person. Per, person. per person. Per person, six uh, nine point six billion dollars a year for just uh, incarceration. Absolutely. This is an absolute dead weight loss. These are human beings that we're losing to the prison system. What are they learning? And what are, what are the skills they're coming out with? They can't work, they can't vote, they can't participate in society once they've come out. So this is really a problem that has to be fixed. It's, a, it's, a, it's a problem related to lack of productivity in our economy. Not to say the incalculable cost and wasted lives. All right, Daphne Lenza, thank you so much thank for being you. here. Excellent reporting. And um, you can read more of Daphne's reporting, of course, on MSNBC.com. And you're going to want to do that because she's brilliant. And, and Thea, I will see you later on in the hour. And when we come back,